Jeff Chapman referred to the nuclear renaissance as the nuclear resonance. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to hear from Chris Pope talking about the real nuclear re uh, re resonance. Uh, Chris got his <clears throat> uh, bachelor's in physics from North Carolina State University and then worked a little bit at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And he's a current student in nuclear engineering doing his PhD with none other than Professor Howard Paul. Chris? Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about some, uh, a little bit about what NRF is, why you would want, why you'd be interested in it for safeguards, and then uh, some additions to the nuclear data that MCP uses to model it. Um, so, we'll start off with what is NRF, uh, nuclear resonance fluorescence. And, process where a, a nucleus will absorb a photon and then emit a photon of a very close to the same energy um, uh, and it will emit that photon isotropically. Um, so then why study in our of the resonances that are being excited um, uh, are described by oscillations within the nucleus which means that uh, those resonant energies are very specific to the isotope that's being excited. So being able to get isotopic information from a, you know, a container that you can't open uh, has obvious uh, material safeguards uh, application. And then I've got a picture here of an actual detection system developed by Passport that does use uh, NRF to uh, find little, I guess it's got pockets of C4 and then high Z materials and uh, materials from Z, as long as Z is greater than two, it'll have uh, <coughs> the um, So then what's the current state of the of NRF? Uh, passport system uh, has, the, I guess I didn't mention this on here, but that first point, they got this award in 2007 to go and, and make a mock-up of, uh, of a scanner that utilizes NRF to detect materials in an unknown uh, container. Um, program lasted eight months and demonstrated full functionality of that uh, technology. Um, and then the, the, I guess, beyond detection, because detection would only require that you know the energy of the photons that are coming off of the box. Beyond that would be isotopic content estimation, which would require um, being able to calculate the rate, being able to measure the rate of NRF uh, accurately in different environments. Maybe the maybe the, uh, the target is producing radiation on its own, or there's a, you know, some other environment that's producing background. Um, so then kind of the state of NRF simulation. So to assist the evaluation of NRF as an NDA technique, um, an effective model simulation uh, should be developed. In its present release, MCMP6 can model NRF interactions for nuclei uh, from carbon to plutonium uh, using cross-sectional data stored in their sixth NRF library release. Uh, this data, however, is not sufficient to model NRF accurately. And I should have put a comment in there just out of the box. So in the past, I've seen where people will model the the uh, their specific setup and then go back and add in uh, background and different other aspects that are missing from the, the data currently. So some of the limitations, uh, the rest scans are assumed to propagate isotropically. There's a pretty good uh, approximation for um, for odd mass number nuclei, but uh, very poor in the case of uh, even number nuclei. And then you can see the function bottom right, so the, the nuclear resonances are either characterized as dipole transitions or quadrupole transitions. Uh, most often, so you can see the quadrupole transition is very not isotropic uh, for the case of even mass in the nuclei. Um, so then I guess the bigger deficiency in this data set is that there's no photonuclear elastic 
background information. So if you're, if you're going to try to simulate an NRF response, you're just going to get that response sitting on top of no background. So there's nothing that's trying to watch out your, your data so you get really good statistics, uh, but unphysical results. So then this slide is in here to illustrate some of the other uh, photonuclear interactions that happen in the energy region of, of interest for NRF. So the <coughs> picture on the left is showing, I guess, the curve on the bottom here. You can probably use the arrow. So this is this peak right around 10 is showing the uh, the giant dipole resonance that it's referred to, which is just sort of a combination of nuclear resonances, but actually the region that's interesting for assay is right below that because uh, in that giant re region, the resonances are so close together that you can't differentiate them easily. Um, but in that slightly lower region, between two and five MeV, they're space far enough apart. Um, so then that just shows kind of, you know, relative to air production and other interactions, uh, nuclear absorption is kind of at this point where the others are kind of trending down in that region. And then more specifically, uh, you've got up here, these two are, are showing the, this plot is showing uh, scattering amplitudes for uh, <coughs> nuclear Rayleigh scattering, <coughs> Thompson scattering is this straight line here the giant dipole resonance, and then bell rope scattering is this on here at the bottom. And then the energy 2.754 is one is kind of right in the middle of that NRF uh, range where things are uh, ideal so that you, you're not going to hit all this other uh, background information. So, uh, yeah, the NRF is just going to be kind of right in Right in between the where things trending downward. Um, symbolically, if you were to measure your uh, elastic cross section, um, it'd be comprised of these other reactions plus NRF. An important one uh, to point out here is this is Delbrook scattering. Uh, so Delbrook scattering is a, is a particular interest that can account for as much as fifty percent of the background uh, by itself. Um, depending on the measurement angle, depending on the energy. Um, uh, Delbert scattering is a nonlinear quantum electrodynamic effect produced by the photon approaches the Coulomb field of the nucleus uh, becomes an electron <coughs> pair, and then that pair annihilates and produces the photon with the same energy that came in. So it's, it looks similar to the detector to NRF as well. So, um, uh, though an extensive amount of work has been done, has been reported in the literature on Delbrook scattering, the cross-section for it remained difficult to measure and calculate. And a lot of that uh, calculation work was done before 2000, so it is hopeful that newer computers could uh, improve the accuracy and the speed of those calculations. And I cite um, a JEA study is being done to uh, look into that exact problem of, uh, can you make these calculations faster? Can you do them maybe online uh, while you're modeling the rest of your simulation? Um, so then I mentioned the, the data library that MCP currently uses. How can it be improved? Uh, it can be improved by adding uh, elastic scatter data and more accurate NRF data to its ACE files, which are just compact in-depth files. You, you're basically you're just taking the in the evaluated nuclear data, that's what in-depth stands for, uh, that NNDC produces, and uh, formatting it in a way that MCP can read quickly and utilize. Um, uh, it can be tricky because these data files can be extremely large. Um, what I ended up doing, I uh, used a MATLAB routine to break the file apart into its components. I could see each one individually, use Excel to make the changes where I needed to, and then use another MATLAB script to just 
uh, wrap it all back together. Um, so previous codes have also tried to automate that process that I did, um, but uh, required uh, some restrictions on, you know, it would it would require say the energy grid could be no finer than two eV. All the inner cross sections are smaller than that by themselves. So now you're broadening it out and uh, having to normalize and making all these. Uh, more potential for numerical inaccuracy. Um, but but MCMP doesn't care if it's on a 2 EV grid or not, so potentially doing what I did uh, lets you use a finer grid of EV. Um, so I didn't say this in that first bullet up there. Uh, so there's 18 resonances in the data file between 44 and 4.9. 44 kV and 4.9 MeV for grain 238. Uh, and what I did was I went in and added 120 resonances that were measured uh, just a few years ago, 2011, at the high intensity gamma source. So that's, you know, prior data was added from 1995. These uh, laser Compton sources are able to, or more ideal for hitting in our resonances and measuring that, that data accurately and uh, more specifically than in the past. So then here comes the, it's been a lot of text, here's the dynamic portion of the, of the talk. So here's the old file and you can see the NRF resonance at 44 and then these other 18 or so in the middle here and then the giant dipole resonance uh, curve there. And then that's what the result of my work was, is put that data in there. And so as we look into future work, it would be uh, you know, doing the same thing for other uh, actinides, other materials to uh, have better, larger interrupt data sets. Um, and then also take the Delbrook data that does exist, uh, adding that into there, um, and then also just testing to be sure that uh, what was done went correctly and nothing was broken that was there before. to go in and find you know, the energy grid and the 
cross-section grid and well, so all the different the pieces of the case file. Yeah, just break it apart into its constituents, gotcha. change the photonuclear portion, and then put it all back together. That's yeah. smart. It is coarse because that's what uh, Enjoy required. Uh, that's how the ACE files were generated in the past. Uh, but I think that that was written before people were doing NRF type work. But my method there would actually let, uh, would actually allow me to define the grid smaller if I needed to. Um, I would I would think that. But you're down to your point. I might have figured how much. Yeah, yeah. Because obviously, like even the stuff that was at the bottom was all normalized. And, 